I'm a resident of Dallas County where I ran for sheriff a few years ago, and I, I know of our next speaker because he's from the neighboring county in uh, Rockwall County. Retired Sheriff Harold Evanson is the past president of the National Sheriff's Association, began his law enforcement career with the Texas Department of Public Safety in April of 1961, full five years before I was born. As recruit trainee, he was assigned to the Highway Patrol Service in August of 1961, was promoted to agent in the Criminal Intelligence Service in October of 1969 and to sergeant in the Criminal Intelligence Service in August of 1974. He was assigned to an organized crime unit for three years, is a graduate of the FBI National Academy, has a bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Texas at Dallas, has accepted the position as the director of security of First National Bank in Dallas in 1979, and at that time, First National Bank was the largest bank south of Chicago, and he served 16 years in the private sector. In February 1995, he formed his own consulting firm, Harold Evanson Associates, specializing in bank security training. And late in 1999, he was asked by several citizens of Rockwall County to run for sheriff. He was elected and took office in January 1st of 2001. And he retired just a few weeks ago in December, on December 31st of 2020 as the second longest serving sheriff in Rockwall County history. As many accomplishments as sheriff, and, and one of which was noteworthy was an investigation regarding a public corruption case of, of, on the 22-year district attorney. It's a very high-profile case. He's been on the board of directors for the Sheriff's Association of Texas and served a number of leadership positions, for the, including the National Sheriff's Association. And he received the Sheriff's Association of Texas Tom Tellipson Award in July of 2018, which is also recognized as the Sheriff of the Year Award. With that, I'd like for you to please stand and give a warm CSPO welcome to uh, Sheriff Harold Evanson. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here, and I see some familiar faces, and I'm not going to talk about statistics. I'm going to talk about some things that I've experienced that really exemplifies the kind of problems that we as sheriffs are dealing with. But first, I want to tell you that the oldest and simplest justification for government is as protector protecting its citizens from violence. Put another way, providing safety and security to its citizens. Now, I don't know how in the world the government can feel like they're fulfilling that obligation when we have open borders and advocating open borders and actually welcoming people to come here that are illegal and not vetting those people who might have COVID-19, could have some other contagious diseases, or those that come here with criminal histories and commit heinous crimes against the citizens of this country that our government is supposed to be protecting. That is an absolute travesty that they do that. Uh, catch and release programs don't work. You know, if, you're, if you come into our country illegally and you get a, a, a notice that you got to appear before a federal judge 15 months from now, what's the likelihood you're going to show up for that hearing? So it's a joke. I'm going to tell you that in reality, uh, in, in uh, 2014, Sheriff, then Sheriff Chris Kirk from Brazos County and I went to New Mexico, Santa Fe, New Mexico, to the Southwest Border Sheriff's Coalition meeting. Of course, obviously that was during the Obama administration. And I had been to any number of those meetings and I had heard the company line about how secure our borders are or were. And I knew that wasn't true. And everybody that deals with the issues and problems on the border knows that's not true. And I'm afraid we're about to revert back to that exact same thing. But on the way to Santa Fe from Albuquerque, I told Chris, I said, if we hear the party line today about how secure our borders are, I'm going to call their hand. 
And I, don't, I think he was probably the number two guy or three guy in the Department of Homeland Security that was there making the presentation. And for the first time, I heard him talk about cooperation and collabor collaboration between the feds and local law enforcement, primarily sheriffs. And I thought, well, that's the first time I've heard him do that. So when he was finished, he asked if there was any questions. And I said, well, I don't have any questions. And, and by the way, I'm talking about border security first. I figured y'all figured that out already. But I said, I don't have a question, but I do have a comment I'd like to make or a few comments. And I said, first off, let me make it clear that I respect you as a police officer or as a law enforcement officer. And I said, I know you must would like to want to go to work every day to be able to do your job the way it's supposed to be done. And I know, and I said, I'm not asking for any comments from you because I don't want to get you in trouble. But I said, I know you can't do that. And I know the reason you can't do that is you get your marching orders out of Washington, D.C. And I said, I really actually feel sorry for you. And of course, he didn't make any comments just as I expected he wouldn't. And I didn't expect him to. And so when that particular session was over and we went on a coffee break, I had an inspector from the Border Patrol come up to me and say, Sheriff, can, can I talk with you one-on-one -on -one for a few minutes? And I said, sure. We sat down and had a cup of coffee and he said to me, what you said in there is spot on. You are exactly right. We would like to do our job the way it's supposed to be done, but we get our marching orders out of Washington, D.C. Isn't that an absolute horrific tragedy that, that our federal government will come and tell law enforcement what a great job they're doing when the people that did try to administer that law on a day-to-day -day basis knows that's not true. And the citizens and certainly the sheriffs in this country knows that's not true. Now, I, I'll tell you, I'll give you a quick one before I move on to asset forfeiture, but when, when I started up the stairs to be president, uh, you start out as sergeant at arms and it takes six years to get to the president's chair. And during the Obama administration, we were asked, the executive committee was asked to come to the White House and meet with Vice Pre then Vice President Biden. And how that works is a staffer from the Vice President's office will call our executive director and invite the executive committee to the White House and our executive director will then say, well, here's what we would like to talk about. Then the staffer will later call back and say, well, here's what the vice president's willing to talk about. And it usually was not what we wanted to talk about because we wanted to talk about border security and asset forfeiture and several other things, mental health issues and our jails. Well, they was okay with talking about that, but they really didn't want to touch on border security. So we go to the White House and meet with Vice President Biden, and we did that twice. And actually, it was more of a photo op than it was a meeting. And it just, I mean, we didn't, we walked out of there thinking we really didn't accomplish anything because he did most of the talking and we did most of the listening. Now, fast forward to when Trump was president, we were invited to the White House and we didn't meet with the vice president. We, we actually met the first time with both the president and the vice president. And when the executive director uh, advised the staffer for President Trump what we wanted to talk about. There were no restrictions. There were no, no, we don't want to talk about that. And I don't know, I've been asked many, many times what, what he was like to meet with, and, and my response is always the same. You know, I don't know what he's like with other people, but he's totally unpretentious with us. It was like sitting down at a board meeting at a, at a big conference room or at a bank or something and having a, a round table discussion because that's exactly what we had. He listened to us intently. He asked in questions. He asked good questions. He didn't dominate the conversation. I mean, it was amazing the difference between the meeting we had with Vice President Biden then, and the meeting we had with First President Trump and, and of course, uh, Vice President Pence was there 
uh, the first time. The second time, we had a meeting with uh, the president, uh, the vice president was not there. Now, the first time we had the meeting, he had the media, the national media in the room, and where we were sitting, we were actually facing the media. I mean, I was looking right at him because I was sitting one spot removed from where the president was. So, and, but that didn't matter. I mean, we still said what we wanted to say, but I'm going to share something funny with you. Um, I was, even though asset forfeiture is a passion of mine, uh, one other sheriff was going to talk about that, and I, I think I was talking about mental health issues in their jail or a couple of things. And so it gets around the table to about the seventh or eighth sheriff and the one that was talking about asset forfeiture. And our legislature in 2017 was in session, and there were a number of bills being introduced in Texas, thank goodness they failed, to require conviction before you can seize assets. So there was kind of a dead, maybe a five second pause and I get this idea, one of those spontaneous ideas, if I'd have thought about five seconds instead of two or three, I probably wouldn't have said it. But I just said, you know, Mr. President, I said, we're our legislature's in session in Texas and I said, we've got a number of bills that are being introduced or will be introduced uh, by several different senators to require conviction before we can seize assets. And I said, you know, the, the cartel is a multi-billion dollar illegal tax-free enterprise or something like that. And so he said, and I said, I've had a heated debate with this one particular senator about the fact that it would help the cartel and it would hurt law enforcement. And I was not prepared for what the president's response was. He said, well, Sheriff, if you give me that senator's name, I'll see if we can, I'll see if I won't, can help you destroy that senator's career. <laughs> well, <laughs> I thought really hard for about three or four seconds about what would be the right thing to say, and I couldn't come up with anything, so I did the smart thing. I didn't say anything, and then like 10 seconds later, I thought, well, I wished I'd have said, no, we're going to beat him with common sense and logic, but it was too late to do that. And, you know, I, I didn't, I, I, like I said, I didn't think about that for five seconds, probably wouldn't have said it, but it turned out to be a real positive thing because it got asset forfeiture at the forefront in Texas and everybody, I, and I didn't give the president the senator's name and, and I, the media, I had like two interviews before I left Washington, D.C. and I had some after I got back to Dallas and and I still didn't give that senator's name, still have not given that senator's name and won't because it's not important. In fact, one of the interviewers was really, really pressing me to give her that senator's name. And I said, I did not make that comment for character assassination. I made that comment because that type bill would benefit the cartel and would hurt law enforcement and I'll be opposed to any bill like that. Well, we didn't, we didn't get them passed. There was none passed in 17, never got out of committee. And in 19, they didn't even introduce any bills about it. Now, I don't know if they've got any introduced. I haven't talked to the legislative chair. But asset forfeiture and border security are very, very important points of contention that we have to deal with as sheriffs. The security of the borders is... It's just incredibly important. The border sheriffs get hammered first because of all the issues, <clears throat> excuse me, that they have to deal with. But y'all all know that they, that does not end at the border. They go all over our country. They impact uh, the infrastructure in so many ways. It's incredible at our expense, at the taxpayer's expense because the government's not doing their job. Now, asset forfeiture, let me tell you one quick story about why asset forfeiture is so important from the fact that conviction, if, if conviction were to be required. There was a case in Ellis County, Waxahachie, uh, Patrick uh, Ellis wrote the, uh, no, Patrick's first, Pat Henry, I believe is his name, the DA. But anyhow, 
About eight or nine years ago, a state trooper stops a truck tractor semi-trailer and he finds 2,900 pounds of marijuana in hidden compartments on that trailer. Well, of course, he arrests the driver, as he should have, puts him in jail. Of course, he bonds out because it's a cartel deal and they don't have any problem making bond. Well, which one do you think they fought the hardest? The civil asset forfeiture of that truck, tractor, semi-trailer that's probably worth three, four, five hundred thousand dollars or the criminal case. They wasn't, about to, they wasn't worried about the criminal case because they knew the subject wasn't going to show up when he was supposed to. And sure enough, he did not. And so therefore, had we had to have a conviction to seize that truck, tractor, semi-trailer, it would have gone somewhere, probably back to the cartel. So seizing assets is one way to hurt the cartel. And, and we should always focus as sheriffs or criminal interdiction units or whatever, we should focus on the seizure of the drugs first. Now the best, and another way to hurt them is seizing cash. And, and I'm sure all of you in this room know this, the dope goes north, the money comes south, and they're almost never, and I could probably say never and be correct, but they're almost never together. That's why if we had to get a conviction the way I just described the scenario about how it operates, we would never seize anything because the subjects are not going to show up for court and they're not going to get convicted. So therefore, law enforcement loses and the cartel gains. And to me, that's not a good scenario. Now, I know I have 30 minutes and I'm probably getting close to that time frame, but I'll be happy to answer any questions. But first off, let me say, uh, as the, inter the introducer said, I was asked to run for sheriff in late 99. And, and one of the, re in fact, primary reason was Rockwall County had had a history of problems for a decade or more in their sheriff's office and in their jail. And I was actually downtown Dallas working with a large bank, helping them develop a bank robbery response training video. My pager goes off. I recognized the number, couldn't connect it to a name. So I called the number and a friend of mine answered the phone that I'd known for 30 years. And I, my response was, I said, Frank, you paged me. And he said, yeah, we got something we want to talk to you about. And I said, what? And he said, won't you run for sheriff? And I actually laughed at him. I said, no, Frank, I don't think so. But after pondering that question for about 30 days, which is about what I had, uh, I'd go to the Y every morning before I started my day and work out. One morning I'd think, I don't want to do this. And the next morning I would think, you know what, this would be an intriguing, an intriguing thing to do. And I also believe strongly, and I know many of you in this room feel the same way. I think we're put here for a reason. And I think I was supposed to do this. And I can assure you, if I would have written the script on how to end my career, I could not have done it any better. And then I've got Sheriff Terry Garrett that'll be the sheriff or is the sheriff. And I have absolutely no doubt he'll do a great job. He's a great guy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.